Iceland's whalers discovered more damage inflicted by protesters today, ships that were sunk in Reykjavik Harbor. The protesters say the Icelanders are hunting whales illegally under the pretext of scientific research. Everybody thinks I had something to do with sinking those ships. Blame Peter Brown. Peter Brown did it. Well, that was 25 years ago, and people still come up and shake my hand. For the record, I had nothing to do with sinking those ships. Not those ships, but I know who did. Among those who have taken credit is Paul Watson, the head of the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. Paul claims many nautical mishaps, because that's what he does. You're in a whale sanctuary and you're assisting in illegal activity. Remove yourself from these waters immediately. Watson is a scholar of military history. He looks a bit like a pudgy General Patton, complete with boots and uniform. And like Patton, he never met a kin he didn't love. The recent hit show, Whale Wars, has brought us notoriety. But I'd like to remind folks that we've been doing this for 30 plus years. I can't go to port, I'm already all the way to starboard. But I just need to know where I'm going. TV made me the asshole. Can you please go off the bridge? We're starting to fog up the windows. But when I got mad and threw their booze overboard, I got voted off the show. Go figure. That's it for planetary duty this year. I signed on to the Eco Adventure in 1982. But Paul's passion for saving whales goes way back. His activism began at age 10, sabotaging beaver traps in his hometown. And the rest is history. But what really brought him fame is when he stood in front of a Canadian icebreaker with fellow activist Bob Hunter to protest the harp seal slaughter. The ship stopped, the two lived, and this seminal event is now considered by many to be the birth of the modern environmental movement. Over the years since, Hunter and Watson have risen in prominence, standing in the line of succession next to Henry David Thoreau and John Muir. Hunter went on to become a best-selling author and news anchor for City TV, a Toronto-based network. Good evening, I'm Bob Hunter. Welcome to Hunter's Gatherings. I was in China last week. Watson became dissatisfied with the passive tactics of Greenpeace, so he left and created the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. I came on originally as a TV cameraman for NBC. Liked what I saw and joined up. Paul asked me if I had any nautical experience I told him I had a canoe as a kid, and right away he made me first officer. I used to have knobs up here until I got hit by one of them. At least I'm not one of those guys who has to write port and starboard on his hands like some people I know. Besides, that only works when you're facing forward. While Greenpeace waves signs and yells, we actually stop environmental bad guys right in the act. Go, 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 go! Forcefully, if necessary, Get out of here and stop your pirate whaling operations. Now get out of here. I call it aggressive nonviolence. And as Whale Wars proves, it makes great TV. The Sea Shepherd Society has been compared to a militia. Except instead of assault rifles and grenade launchers, we buy ships. Some big, some small, all disposable. And even a submarine. Not that one. That was just a photo op. Ours was a mini-sub. It looked cool, but it leaked. Ships aren't really as expensive to buy as you might think, but they're really expensive to maintain. We buy shitty ships, for two very good reasons. First, when the Coast Guard confiscates one of our ships, and it happens, they get stuck with the cost of maintaining it, as required by law until the dispute is settled. The minute they take it, they want to give it back. Only we refuse. It's sometimes cheaper to buy a new ship. But the main reason we buy shitty ships is the business we're in. We chase poachers. 
Some environmental bad guy sees us coming at them at full ramming speed, realizes he has a hell of a lot more to lose than we do, and takes off. If he doesn't, great. More fun for us. We get around the high cost of maintenance by bringing on volunteers. They're not just free, but many pay for the privilege of joining up. And there's almost nothing they can't fix with just a hammer. Our volunteers are almost all vegans, at least the good ones. Vegans are a race of highly dedicated people, healthy, strong, and perpetually pissed off. It's been suggested that their all-veggie diet deprives them of serotonin, which makes them angry all the time. And one pissed-off vegan is worth a bunker full of AK-47. The drawback to vegans is carbs. They bring on hundreds of pounds of potatoes, carrots, onions, and things that store well and guarantee survival at the expense of any joy at mealtime. I'm what the vegans call a barbarian. We hide meat, cheese, and any real food where the vegans can't find it. If a vegan finds so much as an Easter egg on board, over it goes. We do our cooking when the vegans are asleep. Believe me, it's safer that way. A lot of our volunteers are women. I like that because women seem to have more stamina than men. After a month at sea, it's the men who are whining about the conditions and want to go home. The women are just fine, and they're more aggressive, if you can believe that. I know what you're thinking, but this is no love boat. The constant puking is a real turnoff, and the fact that we're rationed to one shower a week doesn't help. Our breath smells like vomit, our pits like you wouldn't believe, and our hair collects and reeks of diesel fumes. <laughs> but in spite of all the prestige and all the recognition, you are not truly legit in today's world until South Park takes a shot at you. Are we badasses? Yeah! yeah! All right, so... What do we do? South Park accused us of manipulating the media for dramatic effect. And you know what? They're right. That's what we do. I confess. It was nothing but incompetent vegan pussies doing absolutely nothing and trying to turn it into drama. That's us. About those two whaling ships I did not sink in Iceland? An angry whaler sent us a tape showing both ships fully restored. Plus two more just like it, all lined up next to each other in Reykjavik Harbor. The tape was someone's way of giving us the finger. Watson and I flashed on the same idea. Why not ram all four ships in a single swipe? So a course was set for Iceland when, while passing through the Grand Banks, without any apparent reason, our port engine blew up. The damage to our engine was far greater than anything we could fix at sea. And with just our starboard engine, we could only do about six knots at 90% right rudder. In a world full of eco-heroes, a lot of people think of Watson as some sort of mystical holy man, guided and protected by an army of angels. The truth is, he's just a brilliant tactician and strategist, and he does have uncanny good luck. Whether delivered by chance or by angels, when the smoke cleared, we found ourselves smack in the middle of a whole pack of environmental bad guys. Cod fishing had been banned in the Grand Banks, and yet all around us were draggers from several countries, defying the ban. And there we were, perfectly positioned to stop them. It's things like this that give Watson the reputation of a man on a mission from God. If we don't find trouble, trouble finds us. So while the government was preventing Canadians from fishing the Grand Banks, at the same time, they were allowing foreign fleets free access. 
Enforcement was needed, and by a fantastic bit of luck, enforcement was delivered. So with only one engine, we went about the business of chasing foreign draggers off the Grand Banks. By running close, destroying their retrieval gear, and perhaps, on one occasion, by direct contact, our stock in trade. That's the sound man and me running to get a shot of a possible ramming. And missing, by the way. Did you see any angels? I'll get to that later. Watson is the Mario Andretti of ship driving. Even with one dead engine, he did a terrific job of chasing away all the foreign draggers. Please retrieve your nets and leave the area of the back. With respect to the World Charter for Nature. This is no Greenpeace ship, and I'd be pleased if you don't insult us by calling us that. This is the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. For your information, over. This went on over several days, all under the watchful eye of nearly every authority that could afford an airplane. The RCMP, the Department of Fisheries, the Air Force, and as always, the Canadian Coast Guard. But the politicians were reluctant to authorize an arrest because we were quite frankly right, and they knew it. Watson became an overnight national hero. With massive popular support, the politicians had to think twice about having him arrested. After all, it was their very own ban we were enforcing. To arrest Watson would be like arresting Santa Claus. So the politicians waited, and waited, until we had driven out all the intruders. Then they gave the order to make the arrest. The Coast Guard came on board and took Watson into custody. The crew, like naughty children, were sent to their rooms. They allowed me to wander around with my camera. I didn't know why until later when they confiscated all my footage to use as evidence against Watson. The ship was put under tow, and Watson was carted off to face trial in St. John's, Newfoundland, charged with ramming a ship. The trial lasted two weeks, but to make a long story short, the evidence they needed to convict Watson was the one shot I missed. If there were any angels on board, they didn't show up on film. And Watson, though not entirely innocent, was found not guilty. I was arrested for driving the Cuban and Spanish drag trawlers off of the Grand Banks in Newfoundland. I was charged with three counts of mischief. Doesn't sound like anything serious, except I was facing two times life plus ten. Didn't injure anybody, didn't hurt anybody, but I cost the Spanish uh, and Cubans $35 million in lost revenues. We claimed victory in what became known as the Cod War. Because after the trial, the Department of Fisheries sent out warships to patrol the Grand Banks, effectively chasing away all foreign intruders, the same job we were doing for free. We're up here on the ice in the Gulf of St. Lawrence off the coast of Newfoundland, Canada. Every year in the month of March, harp seals haul out to give birth. The ice offers them protection from sharks, orcas, and other natural predators. And for a million years or so, this was a sanctuary for baby seals and their moms, who had no other defense but the ice. Now, harp seals are a big deal to environmentalists for several good reasons. They're adorable, they're defenseless, and they're getting killed for no good reason. It's March, and waiting to greet the seals are two distinctly different groups of people. First to arrive are the eco-tourists, known in the trade as seal huggers, and that's not just a sarcastic description. This group includes movie stars, 
the unemployed rich and dedicated environmentalists. It's okay. He's a he's a wild animal. They're not all here just to smooch seals. Save the baby harp seals. Most are here to protest and harass the next group to arrive, the seal hunters. The seal hunters are mostly unemployed fishermen put out of work by the ban on cod fishing. They can't afford private jets and helicopters. They arrive in their fishing boats following the path carved through the ice by huge Canadian icebreakers. The icebreakers cost tens of thousands of dollars a day to operate, paid for by the Canadian taxpayers. The government seems willing to spend the money because they're the ones who banned fishing in the first place. Say the boys to make a noise when we come home from sea. We get right drunk, we roll on the floor, we have a jubilee. We get right drunk and full of beer, we roll all over the floor. And when our rented is all spent, we go to sea for more. And on board is a company of Canadian Mounties. They've come along to arrest anyone who dares interfere with the seal hunt adding up the cost of fuel, icebreakers, and police protection, sealing is one of the most expensive occupations in the world. So why do they do it? You might as well ask why they beat off in public. God knows why, they just do it, endlessly. And someone's gotta put a stop to it. Number one on the Mounties enemy list is Paul Watson and the crew of our big ship, the Farley Mowat. The Farley Mowat is a North Sea trawler with a reinforced hull capable of pushing through pack ice. It's no icebreaker, but it's tough enough to get us there. Hey, who are you going to on board of the uh, Farley Mowat? Uh, there's 25 crew from seven different nations, over. I was told there's a team with you on a project to film a story about you. Well, there's actually quite a few uh, film cameras on board. I mean, that is the most powerful weapon in the world, and uh, with it we're going to uh, get images which we can send around the world to make people aware of what's happening here. Go get a job and quit getting them people's money from them, and you'll fucking uh, have a different outlook on life and uh, with the hunt and everything else. If you had a job, you wouldn't fucking do what you're doing. Calling frequency only. Over. <laughs> yeah, you tell us. <laughs> so why would anyone want to bother the seal hunters? Well, while one group likes to hug and kiss the baby seals, the other, the hunters, like to knock their heads off. We are the boys to make the noise when we come home from sea. We get right drunk, we roll on the floor, we have a jubilee. We get right drunk and full of beer, we roll all over the floor. And when our rented is all spent, we go to sea for more. We do what we can to stop the slaughter. One year, we sprayed the seals with a harmless dye, making their pelts worthless to anyone but the original owners. I'm spraying a seal, Mom. I'm spraying a seal. Painting seals proved effective, so much so that the Canadian Parliament passed the Marine Mammal Regulation 33, subsection 1, specifically targeting us. Canadian Coast Guard, this is a Farley Mullet. Return your call. I want to inform you that we are in violation right now of the Marine Mammal Regulations, 33, uh, subsection 1. The Seal Protection Act, as it's now known, bars anyone from approaching to within a half mile of a seal. Unless they intend to kill it. The Seal Protection Act protects the hunters, not the seals. Once the seal has been relieved of its innards and is nothing but a pelt, then what? Because of all the protests over the years, the sale of pelts is banned in Europe and America. The profit from other markets doesn't even cover the cost of the fuel the hunters burn to get up here, and certainly not the cost of running the icebreakers. So why do they do it? I'll tell you why. It's a blood orgy. They smear their faces with blood, 
get drunk, and kill for the sheer pleasure of killing. They know perfectly well what the slaughter looks like to the outside world, and they don't like being seen as bloodthirsty goons to their wives and kids watching on TV. Fuck you! So they do what they can to smash our cameras before we can get back to our ship with the footage. Hey! Fucking go home! Go home! They look absolutely ridiculous. Nothing wrong with that. We actually encourage it. Makes good TV. You fuck off, you fuck Their English is limited to two words, which they repeat over and over. Fuck you, you fucks! They like to punch out women. Not nice, but there's a certain logic to hitting those who are not likely to hit back. Same reason they hunt seals, I suppose. Fucking go home, you fucking seal hugging sons of bitches! Uh, Lisa got punched in the stomach. Um, Jerry got punched in the face. I got almost hack a pick to the head right onto my camera. Um, I got you got hit also? Yeah, he wanted to show me that he's, he dares to, okay. to beat a woman up. Let's get, uh, who, who, who got any photographs? Uh, eight sealers assaulted our crew and hit uh, eight of them uh, with clubs and hack a picks injuring a couple of them and the Mounted Police responded by arresting our crew and not the people who assaulted. Most of the crew made it safely back to the ship. Some were arrested and taken on board the icebreaker. Good use of tax dollars! Charged with approaching a seal to within less than a half mile without killing it. They were taken back to Newfoundland and released on $1,500 bond. The season ends and one has to ask, did we really accomplish anything? We did get pictures, and we released them to the world press. The bad news is, years have passed and the hunt continues. The question everyone asks is why? There is no real market for seal fur, so there must be another reason why the Canadian government spends hundreds of thousands of dollars every year on icebreakers. And God knows how much on the salaries of all those Mounties flown in to enforce the half-mile law. What possible reason? My theory is this. Every year, the local economy gets an estimated $20 million boost from eco-tourists and protesters who pour in from around the world all needing lodging, food, fuel, and helicopters to transport them to the ice. Protester accommodation is now a highly profitable industry for locals. So with all their good intentions, the eco-tourists are pumping new life into this gruesome pastime. To quote Pogo, we have met the enemy and he is us. As to the seals, cute, aren't they? Take a long, last look. The Atlantic gray whale lived in these waters for 30 million years. There were pods from here in New England, throughout the North Atlantic, all the way to Sweden. Now there are none, zero. Not one single Atlantic gray whale exists today. Our ancestors turned them into candles and corset stays, and the same fate awaited the greys in the Pacific. They were almost gone when in 1949, the International Whaling Commission made it a criminal offense to kill them. Since that date, their numbers are slowly coming back. During the ban, something strange and wonderful happened. Greys, who had never been hunted, fell in love with us. In their Baja nursery, greys commonly pop up for eye contact and even pets from human visitors. Like giant puppies, they seem to thrive on human contact. Then, in 1994, greys were taken off the endangered species list. With the ban lifted, various Pacific Indian tribes, like the Macaw, living in Nia Bay in northern Washington state, decided to revive their ancestral right to kill whales. For food, they said. But in truth... No one wants to eat these whales. They taste terrible. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say this, but they stink. 
The Macaw claim they just wanted to revive the ways of their ancestors, a cultural tradition from which they derive a sense of pride and unity. Grays were once called devilfish because they were so hard to catch. Not anymore. Nowadays, a gray will come up to a whaling canoe expecting hugs and kisses. Imagine their surprise when they get a harpoon instead, plus two or three slugs in the head. <laughs> you can feel the difference at the end there. Yeah. I had to work harder. <laughs> now, I'm not about saving individual whales, what I call free willyism. I'm about saving the entire species. The death of one or two whales, although sad, does not threaten the species. Commercial whaling does. Unfortunately, there was something sinister about the macaw plan to revive the whale hunt. Responding to a tip from a fellow activist, Watson and campaign organizer Lisa Di Stefano uncovered a macaw criminal scheme which they brought to the attention of the media. This document here says the macaw are planning to operate a processing plant so as to sell to markets outside the U.S. This is a government document that states this. The macaw had already selected a warehouse on their reservation to be converted into a whale processing factory. In response, we invaded Nia Bay full force with two ships, a couple of Zodiacs, and a mini submarine. We would use our flagship as a hotel and mess hall for fellow activists, as they would not be safe in town. We would use our attack ship to interfere with the Macau whale hunt, and it was well equipped for that. Lisa had our mini sub painted to look like a killer whale, the gray whale's natural enemy with the idea of scaring the greys away from the macaw whaling canoe. Grey whales hate orcas because orcas mean possibly death. So Is the orca the killer whale? Yes. The Let's try that again. Unfortunately, our mini-sub had a serious leak, a fact we didn't bother to mention to the media. We brought it along, well, because it's cool looking. Perception in our world outranks reality. Much like poker, a little bluff goes a long way. That said, we made our grand entrance into Nia Bay. The locals came out to welcome us, not necessarily putting on their best face for the media. Fuck you! Great for us, bad for them. One guy thought he was doing his tribe a favor by strutting up and down the pier, striking defiant poses for our cameras. We called him Captain Morgan. Give me about there. At first, I thought this was. Uh, <coughs> at first, I thought this was clear cut. Indian tribe fit in. An Indian tribe, in fear of vanishing, desperate to retrieve something of its cultural past. But then you meet the conservationists, people who have devoted their lives to protecting and defending indigenous tribes worldwide. And they'll tell you, in that American phrase, that it's hogwash. And that for culture, read dollars. The gray whale's annual migration passes Nia Bay beginning in October. So that's when the hunt began, and that's when we began our interception. Friday, October the 2nd, we're on board the Serenian, heading out through the Strait of Juan de Fuca into the open Pacific. Just south of here is where Captain Watson figures the Macaw native Indians will be launching their first attempt to kill a whale in 70 years. The Marine Mammal Protection Act, as interpreted by the U.S. Coast Guard, is racial in nature. It forbids whites, blacks, and Asians from approaching a whale closer than 500 yards. But not the Macaw Indians. The Coast Guard deployed two large ships, a cabin cruiser, several fast Zodiacs, and a helicopter, all to enforce the racial divide. Becoming, in effect, the private navy of a Macaw criminal enterprise. Your tax dollars, hard at work. That was the routine. Every morning, the Macaw whalers would paddle out toward a passing whale. We, in the Abbey, followed the whalers and the Coast Guard followed us. 
ready to pounce if we did one thing illegal. All we could do from outside the exclusion zone was remind everyone. Be advised, this hunt is illegal under the International Railing Convention Regulation Section 21E on Aboriginal... If a whale got too close for comfort, the Abbey blasted orca noises to scare it away. And if that didn't work, we cranked up the air raid siren, knowing that if it didn't chase away whales, it would at least piss off the whalers. We did our best to ruin their day without breaking any laws. That was the routine day after day after day for the entire month of October, while the crew sat around and the press got bored. But it worked. The uh, hunt began on October 1st officially, and in 31 days they have not taken a whale. I'm sick of it, man. Five weeks and I'm sick. We were all pretty miserable. I needed the adrenaline rush of a good confrontation, and I wasn't getting it. The media people wanted violence and weren't getting any. Their bosses were telling them to give it up and come home. Lisa's fireside chats, deadly dull to begin with, were now inducing comas in what was left of the crew. Extremely impressed with what we've been doing. And that, uh... We knew we had to do something before the crew vanished and all the media people left town. Paul decided to stage a media event on the occasion of a big macaw powwow. Paul told me to do it. I follow orders. I was given the unenviable job of audience warm-up. It was my job to get the crowd all riled up without getting stoned to death in the process. Dinah, the chief engineer, volunteered to come along figuring the macaw teens wouldn't throw stones at a woman. She was wrong, of course, but it didn't matter because we were under the protection of Watson's angelic umbrella. Nothing could hurt us. Even though Dinah and I made ourselves easy targets, and despite over a hundred tries at very close range, not a single stone hit either one of us. Maybe Watson is a holy man. The Coast Guard pulled me over for speeding in the harbor. I showed them my rock collection, implying that if we went to court, a judge might wonder why the mighty U.S. Coast Guard chose to hand out speeding tickets while ignoring a hundred or so cases of aggravated assault. A moment's thought, and off they went. With the crowd suitably riled, Watson's next act of defiance was to send Lisa with orders to trespass on tribal property. Well, she should be pretty courageous by... Uh... The land surrounding the harbor is Macaw Reservation property. The plan was for Lisa to get arrested for trespassing, giving the press something to write about. But as she got closer and could hear the racial taunts, she began to have second thoughts about her role as sacrificial lamb. At the last moment, Lisa froze. But with a few encouraging words. You gotta get on that dock. No, just jump gonna, on that fuck. Just gonna, jump on that goddamn dock right now. You got all the TV cameras. Gonna, she's on the dock. They threw one of our people in the water, and you guys are doing nothing but harassing us. They assaulted one of our people with a rock. He refused to arrest I'm sure Officer Svensson was just following Macaw orders. In an effort to shut her up, he applied the Vulcan pinch, apparently unaware that it's a fictional thing. Back up. Back up. Don't tell me to back up. Someone managed to bloody her up a bit which absolutely guaranteed her a spot on the evening news of at least a dozen major networks, both foreign and domestic. And that could have been that. But Watson, being Watson, had one more card to play. The might of America's media has arrived. ABC, NBC, Good Morning America. 
But they're not having much luck over at the Macaw Reserve. NBC got kicked off the dock by the tribal police on the grounds that they weren't welcome, that it was private property. So they've all come over here to the Sea Shepherd to talk to Captain Watson, which I'm sure pleases him to no end. While Lisa was being carted off to the police station, Watson maneuvered the Abbey to within a stone's throw of the pier, literally. Now it doesn't take a whole lot of media savvy to realize that you never ever throw stones at the very people who will present your side to the world. It's just common sense, something Captain Morgan and his buddies had little of. And that was all they needed. The press went off to upload their tapes and file their stories. Next spring, the macaw managed to kill a whale. One whale, which all the networks covered extensively thanks to our big ruckus the previous year. With so much media attention, there was no possible way the macaw could bring back commercial whaling as originally planned. In that respect, the Nia Bay campaign was a complete success. With just one kiss. For her heroics on the docks, Lisa was presented with a World Whale Police sweatshirt. The highest honor her shipmates could bestow. When you stomp your feet, you are not hurting me. But you're always killing something. Incidentally, I counted 106 stones in my Zodiac and a thousand hit the deck of the Abbey. I gave them out to volunteers and backers. Of all the environmental evils in all the world's oceans, the worst of the worst, by far, is drift net fishing. The Bikini H-bomb tests in the 50s killed a lot of fish, for sure. But that was a mere drop in the bucket compared to the damage done by drift netters. A drift net hangs from floats like a curtain, just below the surface. Most are about 10 meters deep, but very long. A single net can be anywhere from 40 to 175 miles in length. Like something from a sci-fi movie, they scour the oceans, cleansing them of all living things to the depth they are set. Nets are typically set out in the day that allow to drift through the night when the fish come up to feed. 24 hours later, the ship returns to pick them up. Workers retrieve the net, shake out their catch, and set the net out again in a spray of water from the stern. They do this day after day, month after month, until the area is completely fished out. The Japanese and Taiwanese drift net fleets numbered 1,800 ships. At the lowest estimate of 40 miles of net per ship, in a single evening, the fleet sets out enough net to circle the entire globe two and a half times. Drift nets were destined to kill off all pelagic life in a matter of a few years, and they would have succeeded if someone hadn't stopped them. Very few people ever really understood drift net fishing. They don't now, but believe me, it was a huge problem for all life in the oceans. And it was a bitch for us to get the public concerned. As always, we had no trouble crewing up for a drift net campaign. We got volunteers from several nations, but our invitations to the media 
were largely ignored. We set out with two ships, our big black ship, the Sea Shepherd II, and our attack ship, the Edward Abbey. The Abbey was designed for speed, not distance. So to save fuel, we put her under tow and headed out to sea. Watson put an X on the chart, and off we went. The Coast Guard kept a tight watch on us pretty much full time. I think they like us. I missed getting a good shot of their flyby, so I asked them to make another for my camera, and they did. Asking passing ships for information rarely helps, but it's worth a try. Any barcos por allá? Strangers don't usually pass on information to someone flying the skull and crossbones. One day, we chanced to cross a Russian naval operation of some sort. The Russians threw up a smokescreen to hide what they were doing, but they seemed to know who we were and what we were up to. We're a conservation uh, vessel, and uh, we're out here to uh, stop the Japanese from uh, take uh, seals and birds and uh, dolphins and whales in their nets. Over. Roger, we are very impressed. Uh, we have a very noble destination here, uh, and we would like to wish you all the happiness and luck in your uh, Thank you very much. If there were any drift net ships around, the Russian Navy would certainly know their whereabouts, but not likely say anything helpful during a secret military operation. Landlubbers have no concept how really huge the oceans are. Searching for a ship somewhere in the Pacific is like looking for a motorhome somewhere in North America while riding a bicycle. No problem, though, because we had something better than GPS. We had Watson. People who believe that Watson is divinely inspired typically point to his uncanny ability to sniff out bad guys. He doesn't need sonar buoys, satellites, aerial surveillance, or any of that. You ask him which way, he points and says that way. And when we are close, he just knows it. As Bob Hunter put it, Watson feels the nearness of things. Other environmental groups have searched the seas numerous times and found no driftnet ships. Paul has gone out three times and found them every time. One early morning, about a thousand miles north of Hawaii, Watson ordered the Abbey off tow. Somehow he knew our target was close. As skipper of the Abbey, it was my job to speed ahead and confirm what Watson's instincts were telling him. And sure enough, in a matter of just a few hours, I located a buoy marking one end of a drift net. And just beyond, still setting out the same net, the drift net ship itself, the first of several in the area. Yeah, it's the uh, Japanese, Gen E1 Maru, number 68. And they're setting their nets over. Oh, okay, roger that. We're uh, homing in on that uh, position you gave us for their beacon, so we plan to uh, be there within the next uh, eight or nine minutes, and we'll slow down and uh, and go about our net retrieval. Over. Hey, Mark. We're trying to, uh, we're headed right now to a beacon. We've been given the position by the Abbey, so we want to get uh, as ready as possible with our net retrieval gear. So we're on our way to the, uh, the end of the net. Drift nets are called curtains of death because they kill just about anything that comes in contact with them. Well over half the catch is discarded. I estimate the kill ratio of intended catch to bycatch at around 
everyone on board wanted to take part in destroying the drift net. It was like the flag raising at Iwo Jima. The bycatch includes fish with no market value, seabirds, dolphins, sea turtles, sharks, you name it. No one knows how many marine mammals get wrapped up in these things. With the nets taken care of, our next job was to shut down the drift net operation. This is Sea Shepherd. Stop your engines, stop your engines. You'll not be harmed. The question people are always asking is how do we get away with it? Ramming ships at sea is without question illegal. I have a theory about this. I believe the navies of the world are actually glad to have us out there doing what they wish they could do, but can't, for political reasons. Like those Russians we passed, cheering us on during a war game. The navies watch us with their big spy satellites ramming drift net ships, wishing they could do the same. And as long as we don't hurt anybody, they politely look the other way. Why would you have to ram the boat? Can you not speak to these people and maybe negotiate some sort of a settlement? All the negotiations in the world uh, haven't stopped them so far in the North Pacific. They put out about a, a million and possibly two million miles of net every season. So uh, uh, Captain Watson had decided that uh, negotiation time was over and it was time to go in there and make a very specific statement over. As everybody from um, Mandela to even Gandhi understood, past a certain point, if it's not working, uh, you've got no choice but to uh, get on with a, a war. The prime directive of the Sea Shepherd prevents us from risking injury to anyone, which means we are not allowed to sink an enemy ship at sea or harm anyone on board. But we are allowed to put them out of business by knocking off the power block, the machine they use to haul in nets which hangs conveniently over the side of their ship. We're coming up on the net. Watson's getting ready to give them a blast of the horn to let them know. the enemy ship came forward to watch, which put them at risk of injury, forcing Watson to turn away at the last moment. I wouldn't back off. I had, to, I, had to, I had to swerve away at the last moment. I couldn't hit him. So we, can't, we give up, eh, do we? Is that it? No, they're working on it. Well, we've lost some, I guess. I wouldn't a lot more boats ahead. The next ship in the fleet decided to make a run for it. Hey, Abby, what's happening? Over. Just trying to slow her down, Paul. Just trying to slow her down. Over. I steered the Abby back and forth in front of the driftnet ship in an attempt to slow it down, giving the Sea Shepherd, which could only do eight knots, a chance to catch up. That machinery. Holy shit. Now, as I understand it, Rob, you've already had a couple of confrontational incidents whereby you have rammed, or the Sea Shepherd has rammed the Japanese fishing boat. Is that right? Over? Yeah, we, we came up on them uh, about a thousand miles north of Hawaii yesterday, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, captain decided, with his infinite wisdom, to uh, ram two of them. Ramming these guys is one of those guilty pleasures no one on board feels guilty about. Here's a confession. The damage we did to the drift net fleet of 1,800 ships was utterly insignificant. Sinking a couple of power blocks wasn't going to bring down the industry. But that was never our intention. Our job is to manufacture awareness. What Bob Hunter used to call mind bombs for the media. 
Our images were ratings gold. People noticed and drift nets were banned worldwide. There are still a few drift net ships operating here and there, but nowadays they do so illegally. Which means, like drug lords, they have no enforcement agency to complain to when someone like us, accidentally on purpose, smacks into it. A few years back, a Norwegian TV producer invited Paul Watson to participate in a television debate taking place in Norway. Watson was in Germany at the time, and he might have flown to Oslo like anyone else. But Watson, being Watson, borrowed the good ship Wales Forever from a German environmental group, announced his plans to the press, and set sail for Norway. A few years back, Paul took credit for sinking two Norwegian whaling ships. The Norwegians put him on trial in absentia, found him guilty, and sentenced him to numerous years in prison. In the opinion of the Norwegian government, Watson was a fugitive on the run. By now, he attracted paparazzi wherever he went. And sensing a celebrity arrest, reporters from England, France, Germany, the US, Canada, and six other countries piled on board. Everyone knew the Norwegian government had it in for Watson. But no one ever dreamed the lengths they would go to to lock him up. So rather than wait till he set foot on shore in Oslo, the Norwegians decided to capture Watson at sea. And for that, they sent out the Endenis, believed to be one of the largest warships in their navy at the time. I want to inform you that uh, the intentions of the Norwegian government is to take you under arrest and uh, bring you to the nearest port. Norway are willing to use whatever means we need to uh, take your ship. You know, so if I'm going to lose my ship, I might as well have you take it from me uh, out here. And uh, you know, I'd rather sink it than turn it over to you. Over. It does have torpedoes uh, and uh, anti-aircraft uh, gunnery on board. Well, it's a big warship. Uh, I don't think they'll fire torpedoes at us, but uh, we'll see. The captain of the Endenis made several tactical blunders, one after the other. His first blunder was to cut across our bow, a tactic intended to force us to turn into Norwegian waters, where the Endenis had legal authority. We were just entering this area right here when we were informed by the Endenis that we were in violation of Norwegian territorial waters. We knew to the inch where we were and had the GPS to prove it. For everybody's information, we are 12 and a half miles from the nearest point of Norwegian land at the last position. For their next trick, the Endenis tried to jam our propellers by dragging a rope under our hull. Fairly effective technique, one we sometimes use ourselves to stop Japanese whalers. Well, the crew are uh, right now engaged in uh, trying to get the ropes that uh, we cut. We cut their, their line that they were trying to follow our prop with, but it's underneath and it's wrapped on the rudder. I don't understand his actions here. He's just sitting off. Uh, this would be the time to attack us, but he hasn't done so. Their rope missed our props, but managed to snag the rudder, jamming it badly enough that we had trouble steering the ship. It was at this point that the captain of the Endenis announced his intention to open fire, beginning with a warning shot across the bow. This is Wales Forever, over. Uh, I understand you're going to fire on our ship, over. Take shelter, get the people in safety. We intend to stop you then, over. Those of us who travel with Watson knew we had nothing to fear. One way or another, we would come out on top. But everyone else was scared shitless, because if there ever was a sitting duck, we were that duck. Yeah, I'm scared. I'm scared for every person on this boat. I'm the medic here. It warned us that they would fire and kill people if that's what it took to get this ship under control. And uh, you have to take the responsibility for that. Well, it's very easy to wash your hands there, Mr. Pontius Pilot, but uh, if you fire that gun and you hurt anybody, the responsibility is yours. Over. Lisa panicked. She got on the radio to Sea Shepherd headquarters and told them to contact the U.S. State Department. They're getting ready to open fire on us. Do you read that? Do you copy that? Does that mean anything to you? Over. Yes, hold on. Let me transfer you to our overseas emergency. Please hurry! I can see a cannon pointing at us at this, at this exact moment, and we're in international waters heading for a place where we would like actually you to escort us. They just fired at us. It's a 
That was not across the bow, that was at us. That didn't go across the bow, that landed right there. We put out a May Day that we're under attack by the Norwegian Navy. Take my advice and uh, confer with your superiors before you uh, make a complete fool of yourself and kill people over. I'm in uh, contact with my superiors all the time, so thank you for the advice. Um, okay, I think we've got the State Department on the line. I think we can connect. No, hold on one second. They're firing upon us. Do you understand? Have you ever been fired upon? <laughs> Jenny, they're laughing the whole time. Now, you may be denying this, but this is happening, and you're going to look awfully fucking stupid when they kill Call us. Call the French embassy in Paris. Call they're the French there. embassy. Mr. Wilson, would you like to join us? In the midst of all this, a Norwegian news station called on the Ship to Ship channel, wanting to conduct an interview with Paul. I will put you now on, on the, on the, into the studio, and uh, you will be on the air, OK? That's good. Now, OK. I have to ask you one simple question. Uh, what did you eat for breakfast today, actually, Mr. Watson? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's coming around again. Taking advantage of the fact we couldn't steer, commandos from the Indennis started lobbing small depth charges at us. They tried four times to sink the ship with no success. And that's because the Whales Forever was built tough enough to plow through North Sea ice. As a result, we suffered no damage other than a few dents. I think it's a good thing we have a good hull. Yeah. You know, this has got a thick hull. Yeah. Otherwise, if we had a normal fishing boat, it would break it. Well, the borders are quite clear. You are still inside Norwegian territorial waters. We have triggered a satellite search and rescue beacon. We are in international waters, and that beacon is now transmitting. Then they did something really stupid, as if everything so far wasn't stupid enough. They cut across our bow one more time, expecting us to turn toward land as before. Only this time, with our rudder jammed, we could barely turn at all and it takes several minutes to bring a ship like ours to a stop, even with both engines in full reverse. Watson believes the Indennis rammed us intentionally, but I'm not so sure, because they hit the strongest part of our ship with the weakest part of theirs. And that's just not how it's done. Believe me, I know. I think we're, we're, we've got a lift, so I don't know if we're taking on water. We're checking it right now. The press got one hell of a story. They spent the next several hours uploading tapes, while the Indennis, poor thing, went limping back to its home port. A few months later, we got some very pleasant news from one of our Norwegian insiders. Apparently, our bow had cut through several ribs along the port side, causing so much damage to their multi-million dollar warship that it was almost cheaper to scrap it than to fix it. As much as we'd like to take credit for wrecking the Indennis, we have to concede that one to her captain. Incidentally, those whaling ships that Watson supposedly sank, for which he was tried and convicted by the Norwegian government, someone else sank those ships. Not Watson, and certainly not me. Meanwhile, across the globe, we got a call from the Galapagos Park Rangers asking for help. It seems that commercial fishing fleets were poaching the Galapagos Marine Sanctuary. And the Rangers had neither the equipment nor the know-how to stop them. We are specialists in that department, so off we went like hired guns to chase away poachers. Along the way, we came in sight of Cocos Island, a fictional location of Jurassic Park, 
and one of the most beautiful tropical islands on Earth. We couldn't just drive by without pausing to enjoy a few of its legendary wonders. The waters around Cocos are also a marine sanctuary. Most people think of marine sanctuaries as playgrounds for well-to-do scuba divers. And while that's true, they are also much more. Come the day we overfish the oceans, and we are close. Marine sanctuaries will serve as a source of replenishment, an emergency genetic preserve. In saving these sanctuaries, we may be saving the oceans. Let's hope it doesn't come to that. Even in the world's safest places, you'll run into environmental bad guys. Watson's mythical angels may protect us from trouble, but not before steering us right into it. Without even trying, we found ourselves surrounded by commercial fishermen invading the Cocos Marine Sanctuary. Our radar picked up 15 poachers in just one sweep. Although our intended destination was the Galapagos, still hundreds of miles away, we figured, as long as we were here, why not do what the local authorities were apparently not doing and chase away poachers? We had no legal authority, of course, but that never stopped us. We don't need no stinking badges, or guns for that matter. Guns would cost us public support, so we don't allow them. Which is not to say we go into battle unarmed. We did have a few powerful squirt guns, intended for fire suppression, but useful as weapons. And we had our famous pie gun, a compressed air cannon that could fire anything we put into it, a week in the tropics, and all those eggs we hid from the vegans went very, very bad for lack of refrigeration. So we had a good supply of those. And we had the Abbey, our fast attack ship, driven on this occasion by Lindsay Holloway, a formidable weapon in her own right. The Sea Shepherd is approximately two kilometers ahead of us. They have chased down two fishing boats and asked them to pull, please pull in their lines. And now they're proceeding to go after two other fishermen around the other side of the island. But the most fearsome weapon in our arsenal is a vegan named Allison Lance. Nothing pisses off a vegan more than the exploitation of animals. They don't eat honey, for example, because honey is the slave labor of bees. We put Allison in a Zodiac and launched her like a torpedo towards some distant poachers, along with a prayer for anyone that got in her way. As Allison did her thing, we did ours. Using the Sea Shepherd as a weapon, we went about the business of scaring the crap out of poachers. We'd pull up dangerously close to some big longliner and direct them to haul in their lines and leave the national park. Sometimes they needed a little tap to get the point across. The poachers knew perfectly well they were fishing illegally, and it was obvious that we had the means, if not the authority, to enforce the law. If a fishing boat dared to return after being chased away, or refused to pull in their lines as ordered, Lindsay would close in and remind them. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to drive past these guys and make sure they're pulling up their lines. And if they're not, well, we got a cannon loaded, ready to go. And um, basically, that's about it. Watson's Civil War relic shoots out nothing more harmful than a puff of smoke. But it's a surprisingly good motivator. While we were out chasing boats, Allison, with no weapons and no ship, single-handedly apprehended an entire fleet of eight commercial fishing boats, catching them in the act of loading their catch onto a big tender. How she did it, no one knows, no one asks. This is one day. They set their lines last night, and this is from one catch. 
she called the park rangers in to make the arrest. And while waiting, kept the crew entertained by lecturing them on how fishing was a crime against nature. You're wrong. You know you're wrong. Funny. Not too funny if I stuck it in your mouth and drug it, would it be? And I'm sure everyone was happy to see the cops arrive. They catch the fish inside the national park. This is really bad. As Allison was about to leave, one of the fishermen asked to speak to the man in charge. I can just uh, let you listen to them right now. Over. What did he call her? I think they called her a dirty gringo before. You must know her. <laughs> hole on the bowl in the ever running bowl in the hole on the bowl in the bowl in the hole. Hole on the bowl in so early in the morning. The hole on the bowl. In their hurry to leave, some of the fishing boats cut their lines, leaving us the not so fun job of hauling them in. Long lines have floats and flags attached, so they weren't hard to find, but some were several miles long. Well, no good deed goes unpunished. That commercial fishing fleet Allison apprehended near Cocos Island? Turns out it was owned by a corrupt admiral in the Ecuadorian Navy. Four days later, when we finally arrived in the Galapagos, there was one of the Admiral's gunships waiting to greet us. He sent a small posse of officers on board to arrest Watson, posting a guard at the gangway to make sure no one tried to escape. Apparently, the Admiral had been poaching the marine sanctuaries for some time, and no one could stop him, least of all the Navy. He was the Navy. And then, right on schedule, Watson's angels came to the rescue. While the Admiral's officers were interrogating us, several of the locals, who'd grown tired of criminals poaching in their waters, came out to offer their support. News of our action in the Cocos had reached them, and they treated us like heroes for standing up against the Admiral's criminal enterprise. And where crowds gather, cameras magically appear. Media attention is the one thing corrupt officials need least of all. As more and more cameras came on board, the Admiral's officers quietly slipped away. Apparently, in such a hurry, they left their gangway guard behind. The poor guy had to pee something fierce, but he needed permission to leave his post. And Watson, the only authority on board, refused. We couldn't stay in the Galapagos forever. But the park rangers could, so Watson decided to give them a very generous gift, the Edward Abbey, now painted white. Last I heard, it's still in use chasing poachers out of the Galapagos Marine Sanctuary. Way up north, halfway between the British Isles and Iceland, is a small group of islands known as the Faroes a Nordic word meaning fairyland. And a fairyland it is where every town and village looks like a painting by Norman Rockwell. Picturesque villages with beautiful harbors, towns with expensive trendy shops, unparalleled freedom, including the right to smoke without fear of harassment from health Nazis. Just about everyone owns a late model car. Not that there is any place to go, really. In fact, the Faroese enjoy the highest standard of living in all of Europe. But for one small ethical indiscretion, this is as near to a utopian society one's likely to find on planet Earth. Every so often, perhaps four or five times a year, a fisherman will happen upon a pod of pilot whales. The fishermen will radio others, and then together they will herd the pod into a channel that has no exit. A dead end in more ways than one. Waiting for the whales are hundreds of villagers who celebrate their arrival in a most peculiar way. Ah! 
fun is had by all as they hack to death every last member of the pod. Mothers and pups aren't spared, eliminating any possibility of population recovery. Pod by pod, they are killing off the entire species. And why? I think it's beautiful. <laughs> and how powerful, and uh, the sea is red, and it's... Uh... And once the whales have beached, the people on the shore will go and to the whales and, and cut the spinal cord and kill them in that way. It's a spectacular sight. I don't see the pigs and the cows that I eat getting killed. It's just the same. And it takes normally about five, ten seconds to kill a pilot whale if it's done correctly. With just one kiss, you could change the world. It might not be much better, but it certainly couldn't hurt. It's been 25 years since Paul Watson started trying to save whales. He's rammed ships, he's been rammed, he's been depth charged, he's been beaten by mobs. In all that time, he hasn't given up. Now he's heading out to the Faroe Islands, where one of the most barbaric whale kills of all, anywhere in the world, takes place every year. We had 28 journalists on board, both press and TV. For most, it was their first time at sea. Get your life jacket and get your asses down here. The boats will be released on the captain's orders, or if he's dead, on my orders. In reality, though, what we would probably do if the ship is sinking is get as many people as we can into one life raft so we can share body heat, keep our bodies warmer. The one person the guys on board would most like to share body heat with was a Dutch movie star named Kim Van Koten. Some slick producer promised her a role in a feature film about Paul Watson one of several that would never get made. So what brought you out here? Uh, well, in, in the first place, uh, uh, the part in, in the movie, Ocean World. Oh, my phone is ringing. Oh. the camera or just... Uh, uh, yes, just what, what is your part? Uh, I, I play the role of uh, Chantel, uh, the uh, lesbian vegan cook. <laughs> Kim kept the media occupied while I drummed up some sort of conflict for the press. The press would get all sorts of conflict if we entered Faroese waters. Police, customs officers, and maybe even a warship. But first things first. Outside of their economic zone, you know, they really have little or no jurisdiction. The further we are away from anything that they would consider their, their waters at all, is the better off we are. So we were very careful to stay just outside the three mile limit. As always, Watson is thinking three moves ahead of everyone else. He decided we would get some media attention if he ran a blockade, a whale blockade. Tell them to get the whale sounds. Okay. Hit them hard. You gotta go get them. So for a couple of days, we circled the islands playing orca whale sounds over the ship's loudspeakers. Three on deck and another underwater for the benefit of the whales. According to the data that Seabed Industries provided, pilot whale will respond at a range of half a mile. Orcas are the natural enemy of most other whales. So hopefully we were saving the pilot whales from the slaughter by chasing them away with scary sounds. In the meantime, to keep the media people happy, we gave them all the B-roll material they could possibly use to flesh out their stories. We took them out in Zodiacs, and we brandished our magnificent squirt guns. We unrolled barbed wire as defense against boarding parties. We donned our survival suits, put on gas masks, and set off smoke canisters for no other reason than to make pretty pictures. Okay, here we go. Look at me, guys. Say what you will, we give good B-roll. As to the real story, here's a confession. The whale songs we were playing weren't orcas at all. They were humpbacks, a harmless species that no other whale fears. What's more, we lied to everyone about the underwater speakers. There weren't any, and we made no effort to hide the fact there was nothing on the end of our audio cable. If you noticed, good for you. No one else did, not the reporters anyway. 
They get paid by the story, not the facts. But the whale songs were never intended to scare away whales. Like Homer's sirens, they were meant to attract, not repel. And they attracted a whole boatload of Faroese police. And where there's police, there's conflict. Just what all the reporters needed to justify their per diem. Police and customs, they want us to stop. Police and custom want to control you. Would you please stop the ship? Uh, we haven't entered Farrelly's waters. Please stop the ship. Watson will rarely raise his voice to the opposition. At least not when cameras are around, which is pretty much always. We want you to stop now. We will stop when we enter Farrelly's waters. Do you have crossed the three mile limit? Well, not according to my radar. This looks to me pretty clear. Six miles here, 6.8 miles there. I have right of passage through these waters. That, that means that you are going to make sure that no waves are coming ashore. Roger. How, how, how good is your device? Well, we paid enough for it, so I hope it's good. So uh, we'll just have to see. Uh, I think we'll be able to cover everything except for the southern island. Yes, but we are uh, we are doing it our way, and you have already crossed the border, and we want you to stop so we can come on board. When I cross the three-mile limit, then I will uh, request you to come on board for customs. Our game was to create enough conflict to keep the onboard media happy. And there was no one better suited to the task than press secretary Frank Trinkle. We called him Mini-Me because of his tendency to dress, talk, and even pose like Watson. Trinkle kept in constant touch with various news agencies via his satellite phone. Tell them that we are in international waters and an attempted act of piracy has been committed on the ocean warrior in international waters. He had the ability to blow the most trivial event way out of proportion. Definitely our kind of guy. Act of piracy. Mr. Actor. <laughs> we were never quite sure whether he was acting or whether he actually believed his own line of crap. Are you prepared to spend time in jail for this case? <laughs> uh, if it's necessary, yeah, sure. Police boat, police boat, this is Ocean Warrior. Just to piss them off, Watson slowed the ship, allowing the police to come alongside, then turned down their request to board. Don't let them on. Don't let them on? No. They're coming on board. You do not have our permission to board. We are not your water. Get everybody in their defense positions. Off. Off. One of our more enthusiastic volunteers thought it might be fun to blast the cops with a water cannon, getting us all shot up in the process. Hey, don't look like you're going to use that thing. Stupid shit. All right. <laughs> Introduce you to Captain Paul Watson. I've got a statement here from our clients, so we're going to play that on the loudspeaker. We were hoping the cops would board with weapons drawn, which, because we are in international waters, would force State Department involvement along with global news coverage. But that didn't happen. Faroese police, recognizing a media trap, wisely and politely backed off. Your police and customs boat just tried a forced boarding. They were not allowed on our vessel, but we consider a forced boarding an act of piracy on international waters in an area where we have free right of passage. If we go inside of three miles, we'll request customs clearance and we'll be happy to speak with them. Watson had good reason to expect the police to board. Oh yeah, well last time we were here, they shot at us. I had a bullet miss me by three inches. I still have the piece of bullet. It was a fiberglass tear gas bullet. Kimmy, our Dutch movie star, didn't sign on to get arrested and was tremendously relieved to see the police retreat. Most on board saw the police departure as a small victory for the planet, not realizing that from our perspective it was a tactical flop. Be swift, make noise, no nonsense makes no sense. Nobody likes it. Forget what you don't know. Sell ourselves tall, even though we look small. And dance with our four left. Good. Now, get out of here! 
Uh, we're halfway through here between the islands and we're slowing down so that the uh, tour boat uh, can get pictures. They phoned and asked if we would and we're obliging. Next step, I guess, is to sell t-shirts, postcards, and videos. The police confrontation caused enough of a stir among islanders to attract a small flotilla of tourists wanting pictures and autographs. And best of all, a boatload of Faroese journalists starving for a story. There's not much Watson likes more than a chance to preach the party line to the media from a high position, like the Pope on his balcony. Usually the first question anyone asks is why bother saving a few pilot whales? They're not endangered. The fact is, is that nobody knows how many whales there are out there. The Canadian government was killing thousands of them every year from 1950 to 1964. Every year the Canadian government said plenty of whales, don't worry, they'll never disappear, and in 1964 they disappeared and never came back. The most frequently asked question on any campaign, and probably the dumbest, is why aren't you doing something more important, like saving starving children? Actually, when we're involved with any other issue, they ask us why we're not here. Well, if we're involved with protecting seals in Canada, they ask us why we're not uh, protecting pilot whales in, in uh, Faroes. So wherever you are, they want you somewhere else. Well, I certainly like to see the end of this hunt uh, in my lifetime. Uh, there's no reason for it to continue to uh, carry on. It is the largest whale hunt. This is the 21st century. Let's uh, get it over and done with. You can't appeal to people's sense of uh, morality when they don't have any. I find that the torturing, the torturing of, uh, of animals and the deriving of, of pleasure from that torture is an immoral action, yes. And it's also immoral to feed poison to your children. This remark referred to a scientific study conducted by the Faroese themselves, linking the high mercury content of whale meat to the diminished mental capacity of their children. The Faroese journalists, realizing that Watson wasn't quite the raving Looney Tune they expected, thought it might be a good idea to escort some of our onboard press back to shore with them, so our side could get a look at their side. Don't forget the cyanide tablets! <laughs> Not too surprisingly, there was not a whole lot of sympathy on shore for our side. I think most of the Faroese people share the view that uh, Paul Watson is a bit of a psychopath. In other countries, people eat uh, pig, sheep, everything. That's, that's how uh, people survive. It's an old tradition and we, through many years, many hundred years. It's a traditional food. A tradition? No, a tradition. tradition. Well, you know, for a long time, cannibalism was uh, traditional. It's fine that he likes the whales and so on, but they are not human, they are whales. We'll do just about anything to save whales short of violence. On Watson's ships, Martin Luther King is God and nonviolence is the law. But with that exception, anything goes. During the night, we moved inside the three-mile limit and stopped the ship about a half mile from shore. Okay, we're rolling. Sunday afternoon, a bit of a sea, a bit of fog. There's three boats coming towards us. One of them may, in fact, be a Danish warship. Uh, we've been told that they have some message for us. Uh, we'll wait and see what it is. They had a press conference today in which they made some kind of an announcement. We're waiting to see whether they decided that in fact that we are in contravention of some law that they've cooked up one way or another. The truth is the police had every legal right to board now that we are in Faroese waters. With media attention at its peak, Watson decided that the time was right for the big showdown. Of course, the crew was ordered to treat the police with the utmost courtesy. Okay. Thank you very much, Captain. By now, there were more than a dozen TV crews on board, in addition to the ones that came with us, for a ratio of about 10 news reporters for every newsmaker. Uh, I'm an incitement to you. Incitement to you. What's that? In every campaign, there is a moment of truth, and this was that moment. Family name, Watson. First name, Fred, uh, Paul Franklin. Place of birth and uh, nationality, sorry, Canadian, is hereby charged for violating the section 16 and brackets 2, number 4, uh, and section 6, brackets 1, subsection 2, section 16, subsection 1, confer section 2, subsection 1, 
number five, six, and seven. And and this is the third one, which we should do the first time already. Section 16, subsection 1 of the Act. Fair Islands confer the 1982 United Nations Convention on the law of the Article 25. Brackets 1 and so on and so forth. I don't know if you want me to read them all. No, you don't need all the brackets. Anyway, you're going to charge me again tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> the Danish authorities could read charges all day long. But there wasn't much they could do beyond that, with so many people watching through so many lenses of so many cameras. I'm sure it wasn't the spectacle of one Canadian reporter ready for just about anything they could throw at us that caused the Danish authorities to hold back. It was, in fact, the presence of so many cameras on board. But there was no confrontation, no blood, no tears, and most importantly, no whales were killed. I'm Bob Hunter in the Northeast Atlantic for City Pulse tonight. People are always asking, do we bluff most of the time or all of the time? I answer, we win most of the time, and that's what matters. People call us terrorists, but in the 30 or so years we've been at it, no one's been killed or even seriously injured on either side, not even accidentally. Is that terrorism? Our job, as I see it, is to make noise, enough noise that the whole world hears, then step back and let the world save itself. And it will, because no one wants to see it all end here. Oh, about those two whaling ships I did not sink in Iceland? I know you want to know who did it, but I really can't give up my friends. Check out the internet or Wikipedia. But if the law asks me, I'm blaming Bob Hunter. Thanks, Bob.